Okay, and, we're good to go. And we're good to go. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, as as president of the University Faculty Senate and member of the Board of Trustees, I'm I'm glad to see all of you here. Um, you know, research and scholarship, that's one of the four strategic pillars for SUNY right now, along with student success, supporting diversity, equity, inclusion, and uh, re, um, economic development and upward mobility. Uh, University Faculty Senate has supported the SUNY Undergraduate Research Conference since its inception. And I want to give a thank you to Isabel and to our Graduate Academic Programs and Research Committee for starting SUNY GradCon last year and for organizing uh, this year's session. Uh, I also want to thank all of you who are here, either to present your work or to discuss all of these examples of graduate scholarship from across the system. Uh, I won't take a lot of time, but just looking over the proposals that were submitted to the conference, I think we can say that not only are we highlighting research and scholarship, but the work that's being done today in many ways supports the other three strategic pillars, pillars for SUNY as well. So I just want to give everyone my congratulations, and I'm looking forward to uh, a great um, a day of, of sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. So I'm going to briefly um, also talk about uh, so I'm trying to share my screen. Okay, the conference. Um, so it's my honor to open this conference on behalf of the SUNY University Faculty Senate Graduate Academic Programs and Research Committee. This conference is actually the third uh, in a series of successful SUNY-wide graduate research conferences. And these are the, the goals. I'm trying to go a little bit faster so that we are on schedule. So this year, we, we chose a theme um, on research for the common good in public higher education. And uh, based on the submissions, we organized two panels, one on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and one on health and wellness. We also going to have six poster sessions in parallel. And two awards will be selected by our committee for best oral presentation or panel and for best poster. So this is a, um, 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 a counting of uh, the most important themes that were um, submitted. Uh, the number one is increasing health and well-being for all, then uh, restoring clean water and thriving ecosystems and achieving universal diversity, equity, and inclusion. But it's remarkable that we receive submissions in all of the possible themes. In addition, um, we received a total of 61 abstracts from 13 SUNY campuses, which are highlighted here. So you have seen the, the program, and so thank you to Trustee Keith Landa for his opening remarks. Um, and next, we're going to have the uh, distinguished professor, Dr. Steve Farron, uh, talks that I'm going to introduce. After that, we, um, we're going to have two panels with a lunch break in the middle and uh, breakout uh, rooms for the poster session. So you can always stay on this room link and you're going to be able to access uh, poster sessions through breakout rooms this afternoon. So I, I want to acknowledge and, and, and deeply thank um, the State University of New York for its funding, the University Faculty Senate and its chair, Trustee Landa for their generous support without whom the, this conference could not have happened. The Center for Professional Development for co-organizing the conference and providing logistical support. Our committee, uh, which is uh, SUNY-wide and was done, uh, reviewed all the abstracts and uh, we're gonna prepare also a booklet of uh, uh, proceeding for the uh, abstract. And I want to acknowledge the distinguished research professors who are uh, contributing the keynote talk, Professor Farron, and the Equity Inclusion Panel, Professor Zhang, 
and trustee Landa for his contribution to the health and wellness panel as well. And of course, mostly I want to thank all the graduate students who have submitted um, abstract and who are going to present today and also all the attendees. And I hope that you're gonna ask some questions. Now it's time for me to um, introduce Professor Steve Farron. I'm deeply grateful that he accepted to um, present at this conference because he is an exceptional role model, I think, for all SUNY uh, students and, and faculty as well. Professor Farron from Upstate Medical University uh, is from the psychiatry and neuroscience and physiology departments and he holds the title of Distinguished Research Professor, which is the highest academic rank at SUNY. Professor Farron is a Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Psychiatry at Upstate Medical University. He received his BA in Psychology from Stony Brook University, his MA in Clinical Psychology from the University of Iowa, a PhD in Clinical Psychology from the University of Iowa, and he completed postdoctoral research at Brown University in psychiatric epidemiology and genetics. His research productivity is absolutely exceptional. He has um, authored over 1,000 publications and has been recognized as a highly cited researcher for many years, including being placed in the top 0.01% of scientists across all fields in 2020. He's considered as the top rated um, expert in ADHD worldwide and serves as editor for the journal Neuropsychiatric Genetic and as president of the World Federation of ADHD. In 2023, Professor Farron was named the 80th best scientist in the world and the 57th best in the United States, according to research.com. So there was a big celebration of this accomplishment. His research focuses on the nature and causes of mental disorders in childhood, with a recent focus on machine learning approaches in these areas. So join me in welcoming Professor Farron. Thank you, Isabel. Very pleased to be here by talking at your conference. I'm just gonna take a second to load up my slides. Okay. Let me know if you can't see them. Yes, we can, thank you. Excellent, okay. Yes, so today I'm talking about prediction modeling of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And I focus on ADHD because that has been my specialty for about 30 years now. Uh, but much of what I say could really be applied to any um, medical condition, be it psychiatric or non-psychiatric. Uh, because in all uh, areas of medicine, uh, we're looking towards this concept of precision medicine. Can we move away from having one treatment for all patients to targeted specific treatments to very specific patients? That's been achieved in some areas, such as in cancer, in some cancers where they can sequence tumors and they can develop treatments uh, very personalized to the patient. Uh, we don't yet have that in psychiatry. It's been very difficult to predict which treatments work best for which patients or to even predict which disorder which patient has because if we could make predictions um, early in the patient's life, we could certainly improve their outcomes uh, and potentially reduce the adver any adverse events they might face due to either treatment or due to the disorder that they have. Uh, the idea of identifying people early in their lives for treatment is kind of a holy grail in psychiatry because, when, for example, when I, back when I was at the Mass General Hospital, we did a study in our child psychiatry clinic and we found that the gap between a child's onset of their disorder and coming to treatment was about six years. So many children come to treatment actually much later than uh, they should for optimal, optimal outcomes. And there's also another possibility with predictive modeling, which I'll touch on a little bit here uh, in today's talk, is that the models that we use uh, that use biological data can be used to generate hypotheses about a disorder's etiology and underlying neurobiology. Uh, it's a more difficult uh, task, um, but uh, my, my group and others around the, the world are working on that uh, these days. I'm going to talk a bit about methods because 
the methods are, it's extremely important for anybody who's reading about predictive modeling, particularly using machine learning or deep learning neural networks to understand the nature of these models and their limitations. Uh, because too many people have taken these methods, they've taken a statistical package, a machine learning package, and they've run their data through it, they write a paper, and they essentially published results which are later not confirmed and not replicated because they didn't do it quite right. And we'll touch on why that, uh, why that occurs. But first, what are the data sources? Well, clearly there's electronic health record data, and these are becoming more and more available um, with the advent of very huge electronic health registries. Uh, we have biomarkers. Uh, I've been doing work in genomics, but there's also uh, neuroimaging data, metabolomics data, uh, data from looking at gene expression, uh, any of the blood samples or saliva samples, for example. Dr. Middleton in the upstate has a uh, saliva-based uh, transcriptomic test for autism uh, that he's uh, patented along with a, uh, a company that works with upstate. And there's all sorts of behavioral data nowadays from wearables and smartphone apps uh, ways to collect information about a person in their real life that some people are using for uh, predictive modeling. And then there are simple rating scales that are filled out by patients or clinicians. Just a set of questions, 20 questions, a parent or a patient might fill out about, their, um, about the patient. There are five basic steps for most, almost all predictive modeling efforts. Obviously, you have to collect data, and that's any relevant patient, clinical data, biological data. Uh, there's selecting a model and training it. We talk about training. We talk about um, machine learning models as learning about the data. Uh, they're very different from traditional statistical models if you're used to statistics, where in statistics, we estimate parameters of fairly simple models. Um, but with machine learning, the advantage there is that you can develop very, very complex models that are just not possible with, for example, simple linear regression. After you train a model, you have to validate and test that model to ensure that the model's predictions are accurate and reliable. This is where a lot of the, not, I shouldn't say a lot, but where many published papers fail. They don't, they don't adequately test their model and their um, estimate of the accuracy then becomes um, much, much too, uh, it becomes unrealistic essentially. Um, the fourth stage is actually deploying it and testing the model in the real world. Um, that obviously has to be done to make sure that it works well in the real world and that mistakes aren't made when it's moved from a uh, research setting to a clinical setting. And the last item is perhaps most difficult. That's assuring that models are fair. Uh, does the model create or even worsen healthcare disparities? It's been shown in some other areas, of medicine, non-psychiatric, that some models that are developed in, um, say, a random sample from a community, which is primarily uh, Caucasian will actually produce results that are uh, can worsen the healthcare disparities for underrepresented minorities. So this is an area of much, uh, there's actually much research in this area of ways to avoid uh, these types of disparities. If you're somebody who's a consumer of predictive modeling studies, you need to know how to evaluate these studies. Number one, sample size. Uh, a study that is using any type of machine learning or deep learning neural network has to have a very, very large sample. When we're talking hundreds, we're talking thousands, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands, depending upon the nature of the problem. Uh, ideally, this sample is as representative as possible to lead to more reliable results. Representative meaning more similar to the uh, types of patients it will be applied to in the future. A model has to be externally validated. Uh, you can, one of the biggest mistakes people make with, with these types of models is they estimate a model on a set of data, and then they conclude that the accuracy in their data set that they've estimated the model on is a true estimate of the model's accuracy. It turns out that's not the case. You have to estimate the true accuracy in a totally separate data set that wasn't, even, wasn't used to develop the model. Clearly, the model has to be clinically relevant. Uh, its prediction should have practical implications for patient care. And as I said in the prior slide, the model needs to be fair. Um, the, the, at the very least, the accuracy of the model in, in underrepresented groups should be documented. Now, sometimes the model may not be 
accurate in an underrepresented group, but at least if we know that, it won't be inappropriately applied to that group. That's extre extremely important, but rarely done. So let's talk first about sample size and external validation, these first two uh, steps I've mentioned to you. Uh, the core algorithm of machine learning efforts is train, validate, and test. Training a model is the same as estimating a model or having a model learn the correct parameters to make a prediction. Uh, one rule of thumb is that you use, let's say you have a data set of 100,000 patients, you'd use approximately 70% of that data to learn the very complex relationships in the data set uh, and explore the parameter space, the parameter space being the, um, the mathematical space that defines how we would choose uh, parameters to make predictions uh, for uh, our model. But you only use 70% of the data for that purpose. You set aside 30% for, uh, well, actually, you set aside 15% for validation. Sometimes that's called the development set. Um, the 15% of data are used to determine if the predictive accuracy seen in the training set actually generalizes to this new sample. And what we do during training is we iterate back and forth. We, we run training, we see how well it validates. If it's not so good, we train some more until we get a good result in our validation set. Once the validation set has a good result, we then have a third data set. That is what I'm calling here our within distribution test set. This is the fifth, this is 15% of the data that you haven't used yet. Remember, and you haven't used for any purpose at all. You've taken 15% of the data, you've put it aside for the very end, where you then test the final accuracy of your model. Now, this is essential, and it's an essential step which is missed by many studies. Importantly, the data must be randomly assigned to these different three data sets. Now, there's a fourth um, data set that one doesn't have to use, but that's the, the ideal situation, and that's called the out of distribution test set. Um, this is a separate data set that would, you would use for testing generalizability. So for example, let's say I, I did a, I developed a model in the medical record from SUNY Upstate Medical University in New York, and I wanted to see, does this generalize to a totally different healthcare system? And in that case, I might say, okay, I'd ask a friend of mine in Sweden who has access to the Swedish healthcare system, I'd like you to test this model in the medical record data set from Sweden. And assuming he had the same predictive features and he could do that, um, he would then come up with a measure of accuracy, which might be lower because there are differences between uh, people in Sweden and people in the United States, or it might be the same. But the, what's important is that we know how well it does, how well it generalizes to a test set that's outside of the sphere of the actual uh, training, validation, and testing that I did initially. So, uh, if there's anything you learned from this talk, and if you only learn this, this is extremely important for you as somebody who either wants to uh, learn to do machine learning or somebody who wants to know how to evaluate papers that you're that you're reading. Uh, we documented some of the pitfalls in machine learning um, uh, with a systematic review and meta regression of studies that use machine learning for genomic studies. This was work uh, that uh, my uh, PhD student. Eric Barnett did, who graduated uh, last year. Essentially what uh, Eric did was to look for sources of what we call data leakage. Uh, now data leakage is a way in which, remember I said that the when you develop your model, it should be totally separate from how you evaluate the accuracy of your model. But sometimes data can leak from the initial training set into that final test set. And sometimes it leaks in subtle ways. Now, one way it does is that sometimes what people do is, this is a very huge mistake, is they take their entire data set and they say, let's say, for example, you have a, a set of the entire genome. And I say, okay, I've got my 100,000 people I've used to do a genome-wide association study ADHD. I use that to choose the most um, significant genomic markers in the genome. The entire data set. And I take, I take the, and I say, okay, now I'm going to test, now I'm going to create a predictive model using the top 1,000 predictive markers. And, when, and I use that in 70% of my data set. The problem there is that I've selected those markers based on the entire data set. And so what, what Eric has shown in his analysis is that when that's done, you end up with 
uh, unacceptably high estimates of accuracy. Uh, this can also occur when you standardize or you transform features using the full data set as opposed to just the training data set. Uh, or if you use some kind of data reduction model like a principal components analysis using the full data set. Or if you impute missing values using the full data set. Um, essentially, any data pre-processing that's done on the full data set is prone to leading someone to make errors. You only do data pre-processing on the training data set, you leave the test data set out of that. So in the, in the meta regression, this was surprising. This is only genomic, this is genomic studies uh, across all disorders, uh, medical disorders, not just psychiatric disorders. 40, 44% of the models that he tested had some kind of data leakage to the feature selection. And this was significantly associated with um, our accuracy, statistic, our accuracy statistic, which was the area under the research uh, receiver operating characteristic curve with AUC, uh, which is simply a measure of accuracy. Um, so it was very clear that, and I should say, I should back up that when, I, when we started to review this literature, I knew some of these models couldn't be correct because they were claiming that they could predict with 98% accuracy who had one disorder versus another. And I knew that wasn't possible, particularly for the psychiatric disorders with which I was very familiar. So beware of data leakage, both when you do machine learning and when you, when you read it as. Moving on to another uh, project that uh, Dr. Barnett did on his dissertation with me, um, we tried to see if we could use machine learning to improve the prediction of ADHD using what we call gene set polygenic risk scores. It's a big mouthful, let me explain it to the youth because I know some of you aren't familiar with these concepts. A polygenic risk score is derived from doing what's called a genome-wide association study. And in a genome-wide association study, we interrogate the entire genome with, with genomic markers, and we find out which ones are associated with the disorder and which ones aren't. And you may have a million genomic markers in genome-wide association study. And what we've learned uh, from our big genome-wide association study of ADHD that I did with many colleagues around the world is that if you uh, essentially create a, you can create a genetic risk score from the um, genomic markers associated with ADHD. It has a very, has a modest, modest ability to predict ADHD. And that's simply done with a linear model, uh, adding up the, uh, the, the number of risk alleles, the, an allele is a form of a, um, a genomic marker. Uh, so if I have if I have 100 ADHD risk alleles, my score is 100. If you have 1,000 ADHD risk alleles, your score is 1,000. And that um, polygenic risk score uh, is significantly predictive of ADHD, but not anywhere near predictive enough to be useful. And so what Eric decided to do was to de design gene risk scores based on specific sets of genes that might be associated with ADHD. So he used data uh, from our ADHD PGC just means our big ADHD uh, international consortium. Um, he conducted all the analyses to de define the data set only on the training set only, as we, we know is appropriate. And then we scored the uh, polygenic risk scores only in the validation test sets. Now, I'm going to not go into too much detail here about the, these other adjustments, but to keep it simple, um, when you're doing a genome-wide association study, uh, you have to correct your data for ancestry because people from different ancestral groups dif differ genomically. And you can make mistakes in prediction if you don't adjust for uh, different ancestries. This is something that's been very well known in genetics for, uh, for decades. But we have ways to do that. When we did it um, the standard way, uh, using a linear model, uh, using what are known as the top five principal components that define a person's ancestral heritage. And our hypothesis was that our machine learning modeling would capture some non-additive effects of polygenic risk that were not captured in the standard linear model. And it's non-additive because we are taking individual gene sets, coming up with separate gene set scores, and then putting them into a uh, machine learning model to create a, a, a very non-linear model. So, 
I think I said most of this already, and what I'm going to show you here, this is the, distri the risk distribution of ADHD polygenic risk. So in red are the ADHD cases, and in green are the control uh, individuals. As you can see, the polygenic risk for ADHD is a little bit higher in people that have ADHD. And in fact, if we look in the uh, ADHD, um, if we look in the, if we look at the um, AUC, which is our, accu our accuracy st statistic in our test set, uh, we see it's a 0.62. Uh, uh, these are just two different methods. Again, don't, these are two different methods of scoring, which we were interested in, but uh, this is actually turned out to be the better one, which gives us an AUC of 0.66, this being the confidence interval. An AUC of 0.5 means something's not, uh, is, means prediction is no better than chance, and AUC of one is perfect. So an AUC of 0.66 here is statistically significant, significant, but not very high. So it's still not, um, it, it's, it's not clinically useful, uh, but it is, it is significant. Now, what we also did in this model was we used, we didn't just try to predict from gene sets that were associated with ADHD. We also tried to predict from gene sets that were associated with uh, disorders that were associated, disorders and traits that were associated with ADHD. Uh, and these are some examples. Uh, you can see here uh, on the left-hand side, different traits that are known to be associated with ADHD genetics. In fact, you can see the association here in this RG is the genomic correlation. That's the correlation between the, the, the DNA uh, risk alleles for one disorder correlated with the G DNA risk alleles for another disorder. And as you can see, there's are modest but significant correlations for all of these conditions uh, that are listed here. Uh, these are just the heritability statistics, and these are the number of subjects that we had in each of these, uh, each of these samples. And these samples were all uh, publicly available at the GWAS Atlas database. And what we did when we, when we put all these gene set polygenic risk scores, here's what happens to the risk distribution we saw on the left. I showed you this already. These are the individual examples of individual gene set polygenic risk scores. Again, not very discriminative on, on their, by themselves, but when you put them all together, and there's more than four, there's many, many that we put together, you can see that this distribution on the left shows a, a greater degree of separation. So that we were basically, basically, we were able to increase the separation between the ADHD and the control measures of polygenic risk uh, by using gene set polygenic risk scores. Now, of course, these gene sets are hopefully will eventually be useful for a clinically useful for prediction, but by also discovering gene sets, we're hoping to also discover gene sets that may be relevant to the etiology of ADHD. So it's serving both a purpose of clinical prediction and potentially learning about etiology and neurobiology. Uh, this just describes the uh, random forest method that we used to um, the random forest is uh, essentially a machine learning method that is used to, uh, to make predictions. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details of this here because it's fairly complex, but uh, I'll refer you to the paper to, to read about that. Uh, but I want you to show you the results of what we found. So here at the top, we're just using the simple linear model of polygenic risk that uh, is commonly used. It gives us the AUC of 0.66. If we add uh, ADHD and other phenotypes, I showed you those other phenotypes, we see then the we had a small increase to 0.69, and then we see another small increase if we add the gene set polygenic risk to 0.72. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that we can improve the simple additive polygenic risk model by adding other phenotypes and by adding gene set polygenic risk scores. Uh, that itself is very interesting, and these differences, as you can see, because of the non-overlap of confidence intervals from the, uh, the best finding here to the simple ADHD PRS findings that the result here is statistically significant. Uh, 0.72 is still not very large in terms of accuracy, so we still have more to go. Uh, but I'm very pleased that we're starting to make small gains uh, by using these biological risk, risk measures. Now, is there, is there room to improve in what we've done? So this is what's known as a, uh, a learning curve. Learning curve plots the accuracy in the training set in red with the accuracy in the validation set subset, which is in green. As what you see here kind of looks 
at first you kind of, you might think, well, this doesn't make any sense. You, your accuracy is going down in the training set, but that's actually what you want because initially your training model is gonna be able to, we have lots of genomic data. It's very easy to, it's in the training set, it's very easy to uh, make a prediction, but it doesn't cross validate very well. And in fact, it takes many, many iterations before we get to a training prediction that's even close to the validation subset. And then eventually we see this upward turn where both training and validation go up. And as we can see, this has not yet plateaued, which suggests if we get more training examples, we're very likely to increase the accuracy of our model. And we're looking forward to doing that, with, but we need more data to do that. Do these random forest um, data have any biological relevance? So um, what we did was, uh, the first one should be does, not dose. Uh, in the random forest model, you can actually determine the importance of every predictive feature you put into the model. And so we were wondering, are the, do the genes that PR polygenic risk score has have any uh, meaningful, bio, are they me biologically meaningful to ADHD? And so essentially what we did is we looked at the tissue specific, uh, we, looked, we looked at 54 tissue specific gene expression data sets from the GTEx project. Again, this is all publicly available data. And we aggregated these back into our gene sets to get mean gene set expression for each tissue. And what we found is that our, our gene set polygenic risk score importance was significantly associated with the relative gene set expression in the brain. And that's very important for a neuropsychiatric disorder because if the results came back and said, you, well, your gene sets are all expressed in the kidney, that wouldn't be so exciting. We'd be worried that we had made a mistake, that uh, it just wouldn't make any, it would be kind of nonsense. Um, but this is similar to our genomic data. Our genomic data are expressed in the brain. Our gene sets are also now expressed in the brain. That's very important. I'm going to very briefly mention um, another project we're working on. Those who are interested in lots of details, you can refer you to the paper currently under review. Again, Dr. Barnett's dissertation, where what we're doing now in this project is applying what's known as a convolutional neural network to a special form of data that uh, Eric and I uh, created, which is called a context-informed data matrix. Now, each of these things called SNPs or SNPs are biological markers on the genome. They're genomic markers, essentially, and there are many of them. I, there's nine examples here. There, there could be half a million, there could be a million, depending on the data set. Uh, this first line in our data matrix is simply the person's genotype, which is what we've been using so far to predict ADHD. But we also have these other um, variables, which are we call the geno genomic content, context. These are the, the biological, I'm sorry, the biological context. It's the biological context in the genome it, where the SNP is located. So for example, is there an insulin secretion? Um, uh, is, is there an, in, an, in, an, in, an insulin secretion marker close to this SNP? Yes or no? What's the correlation? Is there a transcription factor binding site near this SNP? Yes or no? What we're hoping is that by adding this biological context, we'll be able to uh, make a better prediction. And we do that using what's called the convolutional neural network. Again, I'm not going to describe the details of this, but essentially we use uh, a feature detector to scan this data, individual data matrix to transform the data matrix into one of those convolutional features, which we then put into a, a simple neural network to predict the disorder. Um, Eric has a paper under review, which shows essentially uh, we are making some uh, improvements with this convolutional uh, neural network. He also has some creative approaches to dealing with ancestry. For those of you who are, who are interested in that problem, I urge you to take a look at that paper. Okay, let's move along to talk about, um, to go back to our original slide about evaluating modeling studies. I mentioned clinical relevance. Models predictions should ideally have practical implications for patient care. Um, how, do we, how do we actually assess that? I, I said before, these other models I've developed so far, they're intriguing, but they're not yet clinically useful. Um, how, do we develop, how do we assess clinical relevance? Well, accuracy is actually not just about being right. It's about being right in ways that are important in a clinical setting. So uh, some studies pre just present the percent of correct predictions, uh, but that can actually be very misleading in in many situations, especially if someone uses a data set which is unbalanced. For example, if I have a data set that has 
5% of people with AD have ADHD and 95% don't have ADHD. And the model says, oh, you're 95% accurate. Well, that could be misleading because I, it, it can be 95% accurate just by guessing that, no, that everybody doesn't have ADHD. Um, so you need to use what are clinically relevant metrics. Uh, and these, uh, I say here for identifying treatment responders because later I'll be talking about a, a drug study. And these two are sensitivity and positive predictive power. Sensitivity being the proportion of responders. In this case, if we talk about a treatment study, it's a proportion of treatment responders that are selected by the model. Positive predictive power is the proportion of those selected by the model who go on responding to treatment. Uh, these are really two key factors. Why are these key? They're key because sensitivity, if you, if you have low sensitivity, you, you will miss important cases and that's, that, could, that could have clinical con consequences. High sensitivity means that most patients with a condition or most patients who will respond are identified. And that's crucial for conditions where early detection is necessary. Positive predictive power ensures that most patients identified by the model are actually positive and have the condition. So that reduces the risk of unnecessary treatments. So two of these, these are the two most important features, I would say, for clinically relevant models. Now, the problem, of course, is that there's a balance between uh, sensitivity and positive predictive power because increasing sensitivity is basically going to decrease your positive predictive power and vice versa. It's kind of a mathematical rule you can't avoid, except for in some cases where prediction is outstanding. Um, so if finding cases is more important, you prioritize sensitivity. If reducing risks and costs of unnecessary treatment is more important, you prioritize positive predictive power. But the ideal balance depends on clinical context and consequences of misclassification. So the idea that just one threshold that you choose for prediction for everybody is usually not, not the case. So let's look at uh, this in uh, this work I did trying to predict drug response in a clinical trial. Uh, so this uh, work, which was funded by Supernus Pharmaceuticals uh, about their drug uh, extended release veloxazine, which is used to treat ADHD, FDA approved to treat ADHD, um, we asked the question, was it possible to predict early in treatment who would respond to treatment? And these are the data that we had. Um, dose, age, body weight, uh, BMI. CGI means uh, basically a clinical change score, how well the patient was doing week one, week two, and week three. The AISR, AISRS, which is a, a, a symptom count of ADHD symptoms. And then we looked at changes in ADHD symptoms over time. I was hoping that we could use the baseline data, meaning data before treatment to predict outcome. Turned out you couldn't do it, it wasn't useful. It was not possible to predict who would respond prior to treatment. But what we did find, if we looked at, when I say predicting early response to treatment, um, we could do it using data collected up to week two or data collected up to week three. Now I'll focus on the data collected up to week two because we decided that this was sufficient and it's actually better to make your prediction early in treatment, meaning at week two as opposed to week three. But we found here, this is what's called a precision recall curve. Um, for some arcane reason, I don't know why, because the curve was developed, I think, in engineering, but it's actually a plot of positive predictive power against sensitivity. But you'll see the term precision recall curve. It's really PPP against sensitivity. And as you can see here, now each of these red lines is a different machine learning model. Uh, the best model was what's called the lasso model, which is uh, very similar to logistic regression, but it has some machine learning features that make it uh, better. Uh, and what we found here was that you could get, if you look at this blue star, you could get a positive predictive power of 75% and a sensitivity of 75% if you chose this as a threshold, um, which we decided was a pretty good threshold for this particular, um, uh, this particular um, application. The question was, now, this was done on a sample of about, I think, 700 children that were being treated um, uh, for, for ADHD. Uh, so we asked the question, would this generalize to another study? Uh, uh, this company also had a data set uh, where they had treated adults with ADHD. So I said, let's look at that. Now, here I'm plotting the receiver operating characteristic curve. Um, and this plots sensitivity against one minus specificity. And you can think of one minus specificity as a false positive rate. Essentially, this diagonal line means prediction is no better than chance. And what you want to do is you want curves like this that bow out away from that line. Now, if you look at the adult in red and the pediatric in blue, you can see they're essentially the same. 
And that's great because it means we did a pretty good job with the pediatric model. Um, we didn't overfit it. In fact, it was so well fit that it actually uh, it actually did, worked well on the adults. Remember, I, I, I didn't know if that, I didn't say this, I guess, but for the adult data, we didn't create a new model for the adult data. We just applied the pediatric model to the adults and it worked very well. So that's good. That's another a good example of additive distribution testing, testing generalizability. In terms of translating it into clinical practice, these are the results if we use all predictors. And you can see the lasso model gives us AUC of about 0.82. These are the results if we just use the CGI only. And that lasso model is only a little bit worse, an AUC of about 0.80. Now, why is this important? It's important because if we only use this clinical global impression scale, it makes it much easier to translate this into clinical practice because the clinical global impression scale is actually a very simple rating where the clinician says, is the patient uh, the same? Are they improved? Are they very much improved? Are they worse? Are they very much worse? It's a very simple rating that clinicians are used to making. So we thought this is actually a good, a good way to do it. Um, the translation to clinical practice can occur because um, essentially, you run patients through this. This is an example of a, an algorithm where you'd start with 100 patients started on treatment. Essentially, 31 would go down this uh, pathway where they would, they would be uh, selected for treatment. And we'd expect out of those 31, 24 would actually respond to treatment. But we, on, the, on the right side, we, 34 patients would just stop treatment because we know, that they, we know that they won't respond to treatment. And then we'd have 35 patients who were we were uncertain about, so we keep them for another week longer. And then after that week, we'd separate them out into the non-responders and the responders. And so this is a good example of an algorithm. We're trying to do some work now where we actually try it in clinical practice, but that's um, requires some grant funding that we're trying to uh, get for that. Another example, I uh, worked with, with my colleagues in the Swedish registry. I was mentoring a student, uh, Miguel, uh, who's a postdoc in uh, Henrik Larsson's lab there, trying to predict the onset of ADHD in the uh, Swedish uh, registry data. Uh, he had access in this data set, 238,000 individuals born and living in Sweden between 1995 and 1999. Use a, we use a number of machine learning techniques. In this case, the top performing model was a deep learning, a deep, a deep uh, learning neural network. Um, so these were the top predictive features for predicting ADHD. Um, now, for me, as an ADHD expert, it's not surprising because all of these are features that are known to be associated with ADHD. So these data make sense to me, and that's that's very good. But when we look at the RC curve and the precision recall curve, they're not dramatically good. They're not as good as, for example, the one I just showed you for predicting drug response. We really can't get, for high levels of sensitivity, much positive predictive power at all. And so we really need to add more data to this. I'm hoping in the future, if we add genomic data to uh, uh, these kinds of clinical data, we make it better prediction. Uh, this is just a simple uh, infographic to show you the trade-off between sensitivity and positive predictive power. Um, and if we use this threshold here, we can get sensitivity as high as 80%, but the positive predictive power is only 8%. Um, not very good. If we lower the sensitivity to 32%, the positive predictive power goes up to 27%, which is better, but still not um, clinically useful. So model it just has too many false positives. So it's it may be good for very low cost actions, like just keeping close a close eye on a certain a set of patients. If we're going to look at we're going to just maybe bring these patients in twice a year instead of once a year, just to keep a track of how they're how they're doing, uh, but certainly not for any treatment approach at all. Uh, suicidality is a very important outcome, uh, which is difficult to predict because it's very rare. We've been trying to do that in the medical record. Um, uh, I'm not going to go over these. Uh, this is a description of actually how the data was selected from the medical record. But basically, we started with a very large sample of patients, millions of patients, as you can see from what's known as the Trinetics medical record data set. And that's a very large data set, which is important for suicidality because it's a, a very rare outcome. Um, we use the random forest classifier to uh, try to predict suicidal behavior. And you can see here, from, we looked at different types of suicidal outcomes 
at different time points. So the 90 days means 90 days after the last data point was available. 30 days means 30 days after the last data point was available. There are different um, measures. Suicide attempt means what it says. Suicidal ideation means the person had thought about committing suicide but did not make an attempt. Intentional self-harm means that there was no signs of a person trying to uh, commit suicide, but they, they, they did something to hurt themselves. And that's typically included in measures of any suicidal behavior. Um, as you can see here, we've got some pretty good AUCs to 0.9 or better for some of these measures. So uh, this is actually where we're looking, we think these could actually be pretty useful. But then if we look at the, uh, the precision recall curves, not as good as we might expect. And again, this is because suicidality is so, is so rare. So if we look at a suicidal behavior after 30 days, uh, again, precision is positive predictive power, recall is sensitivity. You can get a decent positive predictive power, but the sensitivity is low. And for high sensitivities, positive predictive power is not, is not that great. This is 30 days. If you look at 90 days, you can see the curve increases a little bit. It's a little bit better. Um, and you can start to get, um, for example, positive predictive power 40% and a sensitivity of 40%. Uh, which could, again, be used for some purposes. So that useless, the predictive accuracy isn't wonderful, but it's potentially useful for some simple um, methods such as just keeping track of patients who seem to be at high risk because that's a low-cost, non-invasive approach to dealing with uh, a patient. So uh, last but not least, uh, how to evaluate uh, predictive modeling. Uh, the last point I mentioned was fairness. Um, big issue and a very important issue uh, because most data are, sets are collected on majority samples or if, they, if they're collected on a representative population, the uh, Caucasian population typically is 90% uh, of, the, of the data set. And in that case, the model that's created might not generalize very well to any underrepresented group. And this is a very, very big problem. One of the reasons I'm using um, the Trinetx data set because it's so huge. I think now the data set has 100 million uh, patients in their medical records that some of the uh, underrepresented groups are, um, are represented at a high enough rate to actually do some separate modeling with it. If you're interested in this topic, um, there have been a number of approaches to do this, uh, to improving fairness. So there's a, you can go to fairlearn.org fairlearn uh, and they have a whole Python toolkit uh, that can be used to, uh, as they say here, assess and mitigate fairness issues uh, in, in machine learning. Uh, Python being one of the um, languages that's used uh, commonly in, in machine learning uh, systems. So I encourage you to go there if this is a topic that is important to you. Uh, in our group, we're starting to use what's known as transfer learning to improve uh, prediction in underrepresented groups. What transfer learning does is it creates a model in the, um, in the majority group, setting aside the minority group or the underrepresented group. And then it uses the model that was created on the majority group as a starting point for uh, developing a model in the underrepresented group. Now, the reason that's, that this is done is that the, the un underrepresented groups are sometimes too small to make a complicated model. Because if you don't have enough data points, you, you, you just can't estimate a model. You have to have enough data points. But if you have a very large group that you can use as a starting point, the, the hope is that that starting point will help the smaller, in a sense, will bootstrap that smaller group so they can get to uh, parameter estimates that are useful for the, the underrepresented group. Um, I don't have any data to show you on that yet because we're still uh, actually we're still working and trying to get funding for that. Actually, we just got funding for that, so we should be able to do that in the next few years uh, in one of our projects that we're doing, one of our ADHD uh, projects. Um, recently, uh, a group of us. Uh, formed a consortium to look at um, machine learning and neuropsychiatry and published this paper in molecular psychiatry just uh, the act that just came out this year, uh, Quinn et al. Um, essentially, we thought it would be very useful to have guidelines 
uh, for people to, to, to look at and hopefully follow that cover study design, data acquisition and pre-processing, um, outcome variables that are used, model performance approaches, model limitations, and potentials for clinical impl implications. The idea, the, the idea here is that if we can systematize uh, the approach for how this work is done, fewer errors will be made. Um, the idea here is not to dictate how other scientists should do their work. Uh, obviously, people are creative and they can do, you know, everyone's welcome to do their own thing. But just as we have, um, for example, guidelines for doing meta-analyses, guidelines for doing systematic reviews, when, there, when there's enough of a consensus in the community about how something ought to be done, uh, it's reasonable to ask colleagues to try to follow those, those guidelines. Um, so these just came out. I'm not sure how, how well they'll be um, followed, but I hope they'll be followed uh, a bunch. So that said, if you're interested in, uh, in this area, I encourage you to learn more. Uh, it is a, an area that is currently uh, growing tremendously, literally almost every week, a new paper comes out that's interesting and relevant to the work that we're doing and makes us think maybe should we change course or not change course. Uh, it's an exciting area of work for that reason. There's a lot that's new, uh, but there's a lot that uh, people interested in either the more biological side of uh, medical disorders or the more clinical side of medical disorders can get involved in and can, I think, make great, str great strides to ultimately improve the, the lives of the patients that we are concerned with. And so with that, I will end my talk. Well, thank you very much, uh, Steve, for a fascinating talk. And yeah, a round of uh, applause. I see some have already uh, applauded. So round of applause. Um, now, um, are there any questions? So we have, you know, at least five minutes for, for questions. So feel free to, you know, open your mic and ask a question. Peter, I see you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, what sorts of tools do you use in order to train the models? Uh, do you use a, a variety of different tools or um, yeah, what sort of interface are you using to feed the data to the models? Um, so we've um, primarily used either Scikit-Learn, which is a Python machine learning toolbox, uh, freely available on the web. Um, we have been using for deep learning, we have been using TensorFlow, which is a, also a Python based um, set of tools that produced by Google. Um, but in the last few years, we've kind of run into some limitations for TensorFlow. And mm -hmm. so we've now switched to PyTorch, which is, again, another set of packaged, um, essentially routines uh, that you can use to, as building blocks for creating your own uh, deep learning neural networks. And I guess I should, one comment I should make, I've mentioned deep learning. One of the advantages of a deep learning neural network is that you can create your own neural network architecture that's very specific to your problem. Um, when you have a random forest, let's say, or a lasso, or, or a, what I call classical machine learning, you're you basically stuck with whatever's in the package. You can tweak certain parameters, of course, but you really can't change, for example, in our model where we're trying to adjust for genomic ancestry, we could never do that with the random forest very easily. But with a deep learned neural network, it's actually fairly straightforward to, to do that. Great, thank you very much. Okay, Keith, I think has a question. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm interested in the, you know, obviously more interested in some of the practical aspects of these predictive models. If the, the predictive model around uh, suicide risk, for example, is, um, is is interesting and i can see how you know identifying which clinical patients might be more at risk for suicidal behaviors would be useful in supporting those patients i can also see somebody saying well we've got this predictive model about suicide risk let's apply it to the general population to identify people who are at risk at suicide and and but then i i wonder well how do you take advantage of those 
predictions and and reach out in a way that is meaningful and doesn't actually cause more harm than good uh, uh, it, it's it's a it's a great it really is a great question i mean it, it partly involves the question of generalizability so we developed the model in a a, a clinical sample from a set of medical records uh, and that sample is 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 very different from people who have not uh, entered the healthcare system uh, or, have, or or who have not entered the healthcare system as as frequently, because clearly people who have, for example, the kinds of psychiatric problems that would lead them to commit suicide are more likely to be in the healthcare system. So you have one number one the generalizability issue. So right out of the box, you couldn't apply it to the population unless you've you've validated it in the population. That's one problem. Uh, but the other problem is even even when you validate it, uh, there's ethical questions about what do you you know what do you tell a person about their their medical risks, right? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a uh, it, it 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 is a an area I think which many ethicists are are struggling with because on the one hand you could help a lot of people, but on the other hand you could also worry a lot of people unnecessarily. Uh, it's the same is true really for just for the ADHD, right? So if if uh, I do a model, I have to think about what happens if I tell a parent that your child is at risk for ADHD. Um, it's not straightforward. That's necessarily a good idea uh, if the model isn't very is not very accurate. If the model was 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 very accurate, then I think it becomes justified because we're we're preventing a problem. We're, well, I take that back. Actually, we're well. We're potentially preventing a problem. I mean, we don't have preventive treatments, but what we do have is we do know that early treatment is better, and so right. uh, we would. That's how you would justify that type of um, approach in the clinical sample. Uh, but I'm not arguing that it's straightforward. I do think this, the, these issues require lots of discussion. It seems like it also might uh, vary as to whether the person could actually meaningfully act on the information. Like if I'm told that I've got risk for for uh, you know heart attack, I've, there are things I can do. Um, yeah, thanks. That's right. That's right. Well, for example, nowadays uh, you can predict um, if someone has had a, a parent with Huntington's disease, you can predict from the genome, pretty, whether they'll have Huntington's disease or not. And what, typically what's done in that context is that they ask the person, that would you like to know um, your, what your risk is? Uh, same is true for certain breast cancers. And you, you leave there the prediction. And I think that's kind of a very good way to handle in clinical settings. Would you like to know that have this information? Here's how it could be useful. Here's how, it, it, but if, if it's not, you know, it, it, sometimes this utility depends upon the person, particularly when there's no treatment for the disorder. And that depends on the individual. Thanks. And thanks for the question. An important point. Tyler, I see your hand is raised. We are at 11. So if you just ask your question quickly, um, we'll get moving into the next section here of the conference. Uh, sure. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know if it's a super quick question, but uh, I was just. <laughs> I read an article recently about maybe an increased prevalence of ADHD due to the selective force away from manual labor. I didn't know if you had any perspectives on that and how the- It's something. totally wrong. People are always trying to make statements like that. Um, I, my colleagues and I uh, published a paper a few years ago. If you email me, I'll send it to you, where we show that the risk alleles for ADHD have actually been uh, decreasing in prevalence over the, over the last, what, 100,000 years. Um, because ADHD behaviors are actually not uh, behaviors that uh, lead to survival in many in many settings. So, um, yeah, that's cool. not good. Thanks for the clarification. I'll definitely reach out. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Perone. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here.